It's time to look at some incredible artifact finds. It's something we do a lot on this channel, and we do it because we love it. There's always something interesting to see and something new to learn. The best way to find out more about the past is to touch the objects that our ancestors made with their own hands and walk in their footprints in their former lands. Let's set off on that journey now. Our first fantastic artifact is a gold brooch prayer talisman that was found in Manningford, England in February of 2022. Experts think it was lost long ago, thousands of miles from where it was made. The talisman bears inscriptions written in both Latin and Hebrew and is consistent with the style that was popular between the 12th and 14th centuries. The two inscriptions make up two distinct parts of a Christian devotional prayer. Why two languages were used for the same prayer isn't known. You'll probably be familiar with the prayer because it's still used today. It says, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Amen. A further four initials are added at the end of the prayer, A, G, L, and A, which stands for the Hebrew phrase, Atha, Gibber, Lelem, Adonai, which means, Thou forever art mighty, Lord. This was a magical phrase used in the Middle Ages to guard against illnesses and evil spirits. How the piece came to be in England will probably forever remain unknown, but it's likely to end up on display at the Salisbury and South Wiltshire Museum. The beginning of 2022 saw a spate of rune discoveries in Oslo, Norway. The third of them happened in mid-February and is especially rare because it's etched into wood. Rune finds of any kind are generally quite rare in Oslo, so to find a wooden one is truly a special occasion for Norwegian archaeologists. The fact that the artifact is made from wood has made it easy for scientists to date it, so we know that it belongs to the 13th century. Crystal Zilmer, a professor of runology at the city's university, has been able to translate the eight-character runic inscription and determine that it's a notice of ownership. A literal translation of the phrase into English gives us, Asborn owns me. Quite why Asborn felt so compelled to declare his ownership of a seemingly unimportant lump of carved wood is unknown. Some historians believe that Osborne may have used the lump as a label marker by dipping it in ink and stamping it on his possessions. But if he did that, his name would have appeared back to front. There are some beautiful mosaics in Italy, but one which many people consider to be the most beautiful of them isn't actually Italian. It's the Nile mosaic of Palestrina so named because it's currently in the National Archaeological Museum of Palestrina. It's a stunning scene depicting a chaotic scene in Egypt as the river Nile floods and bursts its banks. The mosaic is 2100 years old and was almost certainly made by craftspeople in Alexandria. It's as enormous as it is stunning. The mosaic is 20 feet long and 13 feet tall. Depicted within it are priests standing at the doors of their temples, hunters looking for prey, and Ptolemaic Greeks. There's also a wide variety of animals, some of which are real and some of which are mythical. The mosaic was first brought to Italy by the Barberini family during the 17th century. It's been speculated that the family might have belonged to an Egyptian cult that worshipped the goddess Isis, but this has never been proven. The Nile mosaic of Palestrina skipped out on most of the past century after being hidden away to ensure it wasn't damaged during the Second World War, but it's been back on display in its new home city for several years. Egypt will always give us a steady stream of archaeological finds, and this one is a real highlight. The largest embalming cache ever unearthed in Egypt has been uncovered at Abyssir. Experts from Prague Charles University's Czech Institute of Egyptology have been excavating a 26th dynasty cemetery for some time, but they've discovered the equipment used to mummify the persons buried here as well as the remains of the people themselves, much to their astonishment. The cachette appears to have been deposited in a big pit in the cemetery's westernmost corner when the embalming work was completed. It consists of 14 separate clusters of nearly 350 earthenware storage jars 
containing the remains and remnants of various embalming ingredients. Some of these are perplexing, to say the least. Four identical limestone canopic jars with inscriptions identifying them as belonging to Wahibre Mary Neath, son of Lady Urturu, has been discovered by archaeologists. Despite the obvious dedication, the jars do not appear to have been used. Perhaps Wahibra Mary Neath was extremely ill and expected to die, but recovered. Or perhaps his relatives were dissatisfied with the work's quality. You've probably heard of the Antikythera mechanism before. It's an artifact we've covered a lot on this channel. So if it's a new name to you, go back and check some of our older videos. The influence of that iconic object on this incredible Byzantine-era portable sundial calendar is obvious. The sundial, which is currently on display at the London Science Museum in England, is made of solid bronze and is thought to be the second oldest geared mechanism in the world. It's capable of showing the time and day in 16 different parts of the world, including Constantinople, Alexandria, Sicily, Rhodes, Palestine, and more. Even more amazingly, it can determine the position of the sun and moon in the sky. The mind that devised this device must have had incredibly detailed knowledge of both astronomy and mathematics, not to mention their metalwork skills and their understanding of how gears work. This artifact is thought to be a product of the 6th century, which makes it around 500 years younger than the Antikythera mechanism, but it's no less remarkable. There isn't another piece of ancient headgear in the world quite like the so-called Etruscan wolf's helmet. The bizarre headpiece is currently in the collection of Harvard's Art Museum in the United States of America. While the wolf's head nickname is stuck with the artifact ever since it was discovered, experts think whoever designed it intended their work to be a depiction of a wild boar. The helmet dates back to the classical period of around 2,600 years ago and is made of cast hammered bronze. The holes in the helmet were patched up with other materials at the time of its discovery, but these were repairs and have since been removed, not least because one of the materials used in the patchwork was arsenic. Close analysis of the piece suggests that it was repaired many times, suggesting that it was worn in battle more than once. It may have been passed down from father to son, or perhaps even from one ruler to another. There's so much that we don't know about the ancient Etruscans that this could easily have been a special ceremonial helmet that their leaders wore when leading their troops into battle. The Isle of Wight is a tiny speck of land. Unless you're one of our British viewers, it's unlikely that you even know it exists. You'll find it just off the south coast of England a diamond-shaped lump of rock measuring just 22 miles from east to west and 13 miles from north to south. Despite its size, this tiny island has been occupied for thousands of years. In 2016, a husband and wife team of amateur metal detectorists found a 3,000-year-old bronze knife on the island's Sandown Beach. They excitedly took their discovery to Frank Basford, the island's chief archaeologist, and expected to be told they'd discovered an ancient weapon. Instead, Frank confirmed that what they'd actually found was an ancient leather working tool. It was cut and shaped by hand with a degree of precision that would be difficult for a machine to match, even with all the technology that we have at our disposal today. Christopher and June Priest, who were responsible for the discovery, were delighted to be able to make such a significant contribution to their island's history, especially considering they were only there on a week's holiday from their home on the British mainland. That discovery from the Isle of Wight may not have turned out to be a weapon, but this next one definitely is. It's a 2,000-year-old crossbow from China, and it came to the attention of historians all over the world when it was listed for auction in the United Kingdom in 2018. It's a remarkable artifact, but it wasn't the only object up for grabs at the auction that raised eyebrows. There was also a Han Dynasty oil lamp shaped like a snake and a bronze bell from the Zhu Dynasty era. Questions about how the artifacts got to the UK and where they'd been prior to 2018 have never been answered, but the eventual sale price they attracted reached a combined $342,000.
The auctioneer said that the crossbow was looted from a palace in Beijing by a British soldier in 1860, but that story is impossible to verify. It's a remarkably rare find because it's still fully intact. None of the wood is rotted away, and its bronze trigger is still in place. In theory, the crossbow could still be fired. Let's hope its new owner doesn't plan to shoot it at anybody. When our next treasure trove discovery was made in 2016, newspapers and websites across the world described it as ancient bling in a Chinese tomb. We're not sure we agree with that description. Calling something as exquisite and intricate as this jewelry bling feels disrespectful. The jewelry, which includes two beautiful gold earrings, was found inside a tomb in China's Datong City. The tomb belongs to a woman named Farong, who died approximately 1,500 years ago. Aside from her stunning earrings, Farong went to her grave wearing a fabulous necklace made from over 5,000 beads. Farong's remains were found in a coffin nearby, although oddly her skull had been separated and left next to the earrings. Archaeologists aren't sure if that was part of the burial process or a later act of vandalism. An inscription at the entrance of the tomb reads, Han Farong, wife of the magistrate Kui Zhen. Being a magistrate's wife may go some way to explaining how she was able to afford such ostentatious jewelry. It's hard to do justice to the earrings with words, so we invite you to look hard at these images and appreciate the quality of the work which includes a depiction of a human face and classical images of dragons. During the Iron Age, about 2,500 years ago, somebody took apart the pieces of a horse harness, wrapped them in pieces of leaves, and then placed them inside a leather bag and buried them in Torin, Poland. In October 2020, the bag and its contents were finally rediscovered by archaeologists. Aside from turning green, the elaborately decorated pieces of bronze have survived the passing of the centuries unharmed. The bridle was broken up into 150 separate pieces before it was buried. Archaeologists and historians are at a loss to explain why this was done. If the intention was to come back for the bridle, why break it up when it could have been buried whole? Even if there was never any intention to come back for it, breaking it apart and wrapping it in leaves must surely have been a deliberate attempt to preserve and protect it. We'll never know the answers to these questions. The harness is of a kind known to have been used by nomadic Scythians who only usually buried things if they were making a tomb. One possible explanation is that the raw materials of the harness had value as metals that could be melted down and used for something else but that still doesn't explain why they were buried and then left behind. Did the Vikings design magnifying glasses on purpose? We don't know, but we do know that they definitely made them, whether they meant to or not. They're known as Visby lenses. The dispute about their origin centers on what they were used for and if the Vikings made them only for their magnificent capabilities. The lenses have only ever been discovered on Sweden's Gotland Island, implying that knowledge of how to make them was limited to a narrow geographic area. There's a lot of evidence to back up the claim that they were made by design rather than by accident. Visby lenses have almost no spherical aberration, and the magnifying effect is nearly identical from one Visby lens to the next. It's improbable that the Vikings would have used the instruments to read books, because they weren't big readers. Instead, they're more likely to have utilized them to magnify the sun's beams and therefore light fires. Given that the lenses have only ever been discovered in one location and that they all appear to have been manufactured during the 11th and 12th centuries, it's plausible that only one individual was ever capable of creating them and that they took the secret of how to do so with them to the grave when they passed away. Our next puzzle concerns not so much the existence of an artifact as it does the layers of paint that were applied to it. This is the Pachacamac Idol, which was discovered many years ago in an archaeological site also called Pachacamac, 20 miles south of Lima, Peru. When the 1,200-year-old wooden statue was discovered, it was covered in flecks of dark red liquid, leading many experts to suspect, or worry, that it had been used in some type of blood sacrifice. 
A detailed examination of the object in early 2020 proved that the scientist's initial evaluation was incorrect. The red hue is actually red mercury paint, and it was once complemented by a white color to cover the statue's teeth and a yellow color to distinguish its headdress. That may not seem all that mysterious, but consider this. The closest supply of cinnabar, the red mercury paint's base, is more than 250 miles away in the Andes, far from Pachacamac. Whoever possessed the idol either carried it a spectacularly long way or had the wealth and clout to command paint to be transported vast distances for such a seemingly trivial reason. We have no idea why somebody would do that because we don't know what the idol represents. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.